Hi, everybody. It's nice to be with you. My name is Michael Millerman. I thought after doing some of these article readings over the last couple of months that it could be nice to revisit some of the things I wrote many years ago. That'll give you some background on how I came to think, what I think, and you might find it interesting if you were never going to come across these essays in a different way. So let's just try it. In my first year at the University of Winnipeg, a Canadian school, in a psychology class, I think it was, I wrote this paper on introvertive mysticism. Uh, what's it called here? Yeah, introvertive mysticism and the emergence of the soulful self. Now, those of you who have been following my work for any time, you may know that there's this influence of the mystical tradition or of the mystical experience on the work that I do. So this could help give you some insight into what that's all about as a first step. Keep in mind, this was written as an undergraduate, but uh, it still conveys something I think that is important and could be interesting to you. So here we go. In an essay entitled The Mystical Self, Lost and Found, Ralph Hood explores the question of the unity of selfhood, drawing heavily on William James's varieties of religious experience. Hood argues that empirically, the unity of selfhood is assured and non-problematic. However, the phenomenon of mysticism reveals a transcendent I, whose unity is not that of empirically studied selfhood, but rather a unity with reality or God. The concern then is to suggest that William James's psychology and philosophy has contemporary relevance in linking the empirical literature on self with the conceptual literature on self-loss, that is the mystic experience. First, let us look at the two conceptions of self. So I'll pause here and comment. What this means is that you empirically have a sense of yourself as a unified self. But there are some experiences empirically accessible and accounted for by the mystics in which that typical unity of selfhood is lost. There's your self loss. And another kind of selfhood is gained. A selfhood that sees itself not in relationship to its bundle of characteristics, attributes, likes, dislikes, and uh, mundane history, but that begins to understand itself out of its deep connection with what it conceives of as a more fundamental reality than the one that we experience typically. Two conceptions of self. Uh, sorry. A conceptual confusion that arises in empirical studies of the self is the failure to distinguish between the being of the self and its attributes. I think, perceive, feel, but I am not those various acts in time, writes philosopher William Earle. Rather, I am that ego which now thinks, now perceives, now remembers or dreams. The two conceptions that emerge then are the unity of self found in reflection, usually identified as me, as yourself, as the one that you take yourself to be, and influenced by social construction insofar as we identify it by various attributes, that's one kind of unity. And the unity of the being devoid of attributes. The I, the underlying I, which is less likely a product of social influence. And so he calls these the psychological self and the soulful self. Or did I call them that? I don't remember. There's no citation there, so maybe that was my own terminology. At any rate, the psychological self and the soulful self. It's well established that the experience of unity is a defining feature of the soulful self that emerges upon the loss of the reflexive psychological self. In his essay, Hood suggests that a spiritual revolution is now in progress, a revolution made possible by a return to serious discussion of the soul. I wonder 20 years later, can we say that that spiritual revolution has affected this return to a serious discussion of the soul. Somehow, it doesn't really seem to be the case. Although such a concept may worry some psychologists who perhaps, like the behaviorists, wish to abstract themselves from the whole of what it means to be human and keep their discipline empirical, it seems that William James was correct in noting that no conventional restrictions can keep metaphysical or even epistemological inquiries out of the psychology books. For indeed, psychological and philosophical conceptions of self rapidly give way to mystical ones when they are carried to their conclusion. To study such a concept, however, requires the proper methodological tools. For psychology, regardless of its scope, 
must still proceed as a science. James insisted that first and foremost and always, the primary method of psychology is introspective observation. He demanded careful observation and description of internal states in a way anticipating the school of phenomenology. Husserl, founder of phenomenology, stressed that psychology should be the first science to emerge with the transcendental perspective. That is, upon the realization that the I, the soulful self, is at the root of our experience of reality and indeed constitutes all reality. According to James and Husserl, then, the methodological tool for study of the I is introspection, which provides us with self-knowledge. James suggests that we must be radically empirical with introspection, allowing metaphysics to illuminate the phenomena discovered thereby. James's empiricism is experience. And again, quoting from Hood's essay, we have James's empirical postulate. Everything real must be experienceable somewhere. And every kind of thing experienced must somewhere be real. And so on that basis, we can now turn to the mystical experience itself. We have everywhere found that the mystic, having suppressed the empirical factors of the stream of consciousness, arrives at a pure ego or pure consciousness, and that the emergence of this pure ego is the introvertive experience, writes Stace. The self in recuperating itself achieves an ontological and epistemological rock bottom. What we have is the synthesis or union of subjective absolute reality, the I, here the soulful self, and objective absolute reality, or God. Perhaps at this point it would be wise to quote directly from one of the most important figures of philosophy and mysticism, Plotinus, quote, In the vision, that which sees is not reason, but something greater than and prior to reason something presupposed by reason, as is the object of vision. He who then sees himself when he sees, will see himself as a simple being. And here I interject the undifferentiated unity of the I and God. Will be united to himself as such, will feel himself, become such. We ought not even to say that he will see, but that he will be that which he sees. If indeed it is possible any longer to distinguish seer and seen, and not boldly to affirm that the two are one. In this state, the seer does not see or distinguish or imagine two things. He becomes another. He ceases to be himself and to belong to himself. And again, as I interject, the psychological self is lost, and the I, devoid of all attributes, no longer has anything by which to distinguish itself from absolute reality or from divinity. He belongs to him and is one with him, like two concentric circles. They are one when they coincide, and two only when they are separated. It is only in this sense that the soul is other. Therefore, the vision, the mystical vision, is hard to describe. For how can one describe as other than oneself that which, when one saw it, seemed to be one with oneself? And then the concluding paragraph of this short undergraduate first year psychology essay, the soul can return to psychology as a significant concept if the facts of mysticism are noted. After reflecting upon the construct of the soulful self, psychology can affect a return to positivity, meaning not like as opposed to negativity, negativity, but positivity like the posited facts of psychological life, like the real, actual, um, outward expressions of psychological life. Okay, so after reflecting upon the construct of the soulful self, psychology can affect a return to positivity that is no longer transcendentally naive. Let me just explain that briefly. So tri transcendentally naive means you normally interpret the world as consisting of things and objects out there. So you're over here, in here, and the world that's over and against you is out there consisting of things, objects, and you yourself have a certain thingly or objective interpretation of yourself as this bundle of attributes that you have access to in normal empirical intuition automatically. Well, that's transcendentally naive because it hasn't yet undergone the process that Husserl 
led us through of getting access to the transcendental domain or dimension. So these are operations in Husserlian phenomenology that you may or may not be familiar with, but that somehow are mentioned or presupposed by this essay. So that moving from taking the world as consisting of objects and things out there and ourself that way to this shift from the psychological to the soulful self and then back out again. So that's what this return to positivity means. A return to our ordinary lives after having first affected this conversion towards the soulful self. If psychology as a science wishes to be genuine, that is, if it demands insight in all matters, it must turn to transcendental subjectivity as a matter of primary concern. For it is the soulful self, writes Smith, that harbors the ultimate sources of meaning. William Earl too agrees with this conclusion when he reminds us forcefully that only the most naive and incoherent empiricism would imagine that it can begin with psychological facts of common life, hoping to end with a clearer notion or even refutation of the very soulful self which is their origin and active source. In James's Notes for Varieties, Varieties of Religious Experience, he states, Remember that the whole idea lies in really believing that through a certain point, or in part, you coalesce and are identical with the eternal. As Ralph Hood suggests in his conclusion, psychologists need not have that belief as a statement of faith, but it's not bad as an empirical hypothesis. And that's the end of the paper. So this paper that I wrote as an undergraduate called, um, what is it called here? The, soul, the introvertive mysticism and the emergence of the soulful self, meaning there's a kind of process or method which here we have kind of two key representatives of, or three, let's say, William James, Edmund Husserl, and Plotinus. So bringing together Neoplatonic kind of mysticism or mysticism of a certain conceptual philosophical sense and the Husserlian phenomenology as well as William James's radical empiricism. All of this to say that beyond our everyday understanding of ourselves, and the unity of our everyday self-conception, there's an underlying soulful self. And we don't have the right footing for understanding human psychology if we ignore that deeper soulful self, how it relates to the psychological self and the role that it plays in our lives. So, there you go. Two conceptions of self, the spiritual revolution, the method is a mysticism, radical empiricism, phenomenology. We have recourse to these experiences like the ones that Plotinus mentioned here, a vision that's hard to describe, and the conclusion calling for the return of the soul to psychology. Now, what I want to point out for those of you who wonder about how this relates to the other things that I've worked on or written about uh, or talked about on this channel or in my school You'll notice that there's no Heidegger here yet. There's no even Plato here yet. There's Plotinus, but no Plato. There's no Strauss. There's no Dugan. And yet somehow this is the root of the interest in those other figures and in those other thinkers. The move from Plotinus, Husserl, William Earl, the soulful self, to a concern with Heidegger, Heideggerian phenomenology, fundamental ontology, comparative political mysticism, and all of that. It's not a it's not a far step at all. So I think this is a nice thing to do. Read some of these older essays. Uh, hopefully you find it interesting. It doesn't have to have anything to do with your understanding of me, obviously. Rather, it's much more valuable if it can direct you to the sources themselves. So, okay, Ralph Hood, The Mystical Self, Lost and Found, William James, Varieties of Religious Experience. And just to let you know, some of the other works cited here, Walter Stace, The Teachings of the Mystics, Walter Stace, Mysticism and Philosophy, um, The Cartesian Meditations, Ralph Hood, Mysticism, The Unity Thesis and the Paranormal, Ralph Hood um, from the International Journal for the Psychology of Religion, William Earl on Mystical Reason. I very well remember reading that when I first did. 
And there you go. I hope you found that to be helpful. A nice short 15 minute video today. Feel free to, uh, to comment. I hope you do get to follow up on some of these sources. I thank you for your time and attention. Please like, subscribe, share, visit millermanschool.com if you're interested in courses. There are paid courses and a long free trial as well. See you in the next video.